the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not a light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and, through, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him know. Okay. Yeah. Dat is een uh, andere be begin van een Bali avond. That's a different beginning of a Bali evening. The normal um, we listen to Maureen Taven. Uh, she is um, she won in 2018 the uh, Colombina. And she's uh, one of the uh, founders of the theater group De Mug met de Gouden Tand. Very warm welcome to you. We will be hearing uh, two more texts uh, by you. Thank you for reading this one out. John, a uh, fragment of um, uh, Johannes and John the, Bep jo John the Evangelist, uh, The Word Became Flesh. And um, um, we start this because we're first going to listen to uh, uh, Tom Holland, and then we're going to have a conversation with Tom Holland. And it's a great honor to introduce him. I don't think he needs much introduction, but um, it's the fifth time you're here. Um, it's wonderful that you're here again. And uh, on the occasion of a new book, uh, uh, a huge book, Dominion, Heerschappij. Uh, you can buy it uh, uh, here at the, at the end of the, of the evening as well. Um, in Holland, published by Atheneum Boekhandel. And um, um, I, I have to say, it's a, it's a humongous work. It's a huge book. It's a wonderful book. It's a great book. It's a, it's, I've read it you know, in one go. It kept me from the white slopes of Bernard Oberland uh, 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 to read it. Um, and I love skiing. So, I mean, if it keeps you from skiing, it's a good, it's a good read. And um, <laughs> um, um, 
it's, uh, I mean, Hol Tom Holland is known as an historian for, 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 for big books. Um, just to name a few, I mean, uh, the first one actually which caught the uh, international attention was Rubicon, Triumph and Tragedy of the Roman Republic. And then came the Persian Fire, um, um, about the Achaemenides uh, kingship in Persia. Um, he's written about uh, the, the, the popes. Uh, he's written about Muhammad um, uh, in the shadow of the sword. Um, uh, and a millennium, the end of the world, and the forging of Christendom. It's, and one of the wonderful things about Tom Holland's books is that um, he writes with an idea, and he writes about ideas. And um, um, he, all the time, he takes a subject and distills sort of the original idea by which man makes um, uh, uh, power and man uh, uses power to um, uh, and makes uh, empires. Um, and this one uh, is about the making of the Western mind. And I think it's a turn in, I would personally think, I've read with a lot of pleasure many of your books, and I think this is a turn in your writership because um, because it's not about a an empire like the Achaemenid Empire or the, Sa the, the Julius Caesar and the coming of the empire, the Roman Empire. It's more a real history of ideas. And it's an impressive book. Um, it starts in Athens and it ends with Merkel and, uh, and Orban. Um, and, we've, and in between, um, we really keep thinking about what shaped the Western mind. How do we think today? And what did shape our thinking today? And the way we look at the world and the way, the way we, um, the way we uh, approach the world. And also maybe, um, 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 maybe you know um, uh, uh, Jared Diamond's um, uh, Guns, Germs and Steel, you know, how the West became so successful and what is the Western mind. And according to Tom Holland, it has a lot, maybe everything, to do with uh, Christian thinking and Christian scriptures. Um, this is not a history of Christianity. It's a, it's a big essay and a big um, 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 essay, yes, um, about, uh, um, and which, which uh, to me, made me think about how come that we think in the way we do think. We're going to first listen to um, Tom Holland uh, explaining a little bit about his book. Um, it's way too big to, um, to do that in sort of 20 minutes. Or, and then we have a conversation about it. And then I ask you to come in. And um, we have two texts in between to listen to as well. Tom Holland, thank you for coming again to the Bali. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yuri, and thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be back at Dabali, not least because um, the previous times that I've, I've come here have actually played um, a great part in, uh, in inspiring me in wanting to write this new book and, indeed, to stress test some of the that some of the themes, some of the subjects. So I, I've come here and I've talked variously um, about the beginnings of Islam uh, and about the Psalms and about uh, Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings and the Second World War. And all of these uh, elements are, are within the new book. Um, and I, 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 I think that um, the argument of the book is, is a sweeping one. And I don't think I would have had the nerve to embark on it if I had not had the chance to, to, to come to places like the Bali and, and stress test them. So I, I, I'm very grateful to be back here and have the chance to talk about it. And yes, the, the, the book is, as the English subtitle has it, a kind of about the making of the Western mind. But ladies and gentlemen, um, the making of the Western mind is a subtitle I did not choose. It was chosen by my very, very nervous, very, very uh, atheistical, um, very, very enthusiast for the Enlightenment-esque editor in London, who felt that um, any mention of Christianity on the cover, whether in the form of you know, a cross or um, whether uh, in terms of the subtitle, might put people off. It's not really about the making of the Western mind. The, sub the Dutch subtitle alludes to what it really is. It's, it's, it's about the making of Christendom and how Christendom has made us. 
And the argument really can be, um, can be summed up very simply, that the coming of Christianity, its incubation and its emergence and its evolution in the world of classical antiquity is the most decisively revolutionary moment, certainly in, uh, in, in European history, and I think uh, very possibly globally as well. Um, and that the idea that uh, I, I had in the back of my mind as I was writing it um, was that the, 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 the West, the modern West, if that's a goldfish bowl and we are the goldfish, then the waters that we swim in are Christian. But then when I'd finished it, uh, another metaphor struck me. Um, there was a, a TV series was shown in England about Chernobyl. It was a drama. Um, and there was a scene where um, two of the apparatchiks who were trying to uh, control this terrible uh, rupture in the, the, the power station are right up close to the radiation leak. And they look up and you can see the radioactivity leaking because it is ionizing the air. But then, of course, the threat from the radiation is that as it spreads across the forests of Ukraine, as it reaches Kiev, as it reaches Scandinavia, as it reaches Amsterdam, the radioactivity is invisible. But people are still breathing it in. People are still being affected by it, even though they may not be aware that it's affecting them. And by that, I do not mean to say that uh, Christianity makes your hair drop out and kills you but just that its, its effects uh, may not be obviously apparent. So if you are you know, in, in, in the kind of cathedral that we had in the opening graphic, that's kind of like being up close and seeing the air ionizing. You know, if you're thinking about uh, the Crusades or Thomas Aquinas or uh, the Pilgrim Fathers, um, of course, you're, you're, you're completely aware that, 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 that Christianity is having this, this, this transformative effect. But if you are thinking about things that may not seem to be distinctively Christian at all, if you're thinking about categories like uh, homosexuality, if you're thinking about categories like uh, the secular, if, even if you're thinking about categories like uh, the very concept of religion, all of which we may be tempted to take for granted. In fact, we should not take these for granted. These are, none of them are categories that would have meant anything to people in the Roman Empire. They are highly culturally contingent, and they are bred of the depths of Christian history, of Christian theology, and as I am reminded by today's reading that we just heard, by Christian scripture. And it's a kind of classic Dabali maneuver that I've never, I've never really talked about this before. But of course, one of the many ways in which Christianity has shaped and molded us in ways, again, that we, we, we often may not be aware of is through the impact of biblical stories and biblical poetry and biblical imagery. Uh, and this is something that I was already reflecting upon before I realized that this was, this, this was what you know, we had arranged to have. Uh, yesterday I went to Leiden. This morning I, I went to Harlem. And as, as every, uh, every foreigner who comes here inevitably is, one is struck by, by the beauty and the, and, and the kind of self-confidence of the centers of these beautiful towns, these expressions of, of the Dutch golden age. Um, and of course, what it was that, that, that made the Dutch Republic so successful, uh, so culturally productive, um, so wealthy, is the subject of, 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 of huge amounts of, of historiographical inquiry. People write about the economy, people write about um, all kinds of aspects. But it seems clear to me that, 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 that a crucial part of it is the sense 
the Dutch in the 17th century have of themselves as a new Israel. And of course, both Harlem and Leiden absolutely focus that. Both were the objects of, of great sieges. And the fact that, that, that Harlem was eventually conquered didn't drive the Dutch to despair because they had the assurance that even though Jerusalem had fallen to the Babylonians, nevertheless, the God of Israel did not abandon his people. And so the Dutch could have the assurance that their God would not abandon them. And that was a sense that was sharpened for them by uh, the fact that Leiden did not surrender and that the flood waters came and drowned the chariots of Pharaoh. And the Dutch could imagine themselves as a people redeemed from slavery, offered a new land, a new prospect. And this sense in which our minds, all our minds, because, because my country too, England, the beginning of England, the first history we have of England written by a, a monk called Bede, again in Bede's account, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes come to Britain and are given this land. And whenever there are kings who are ungodly, who oppose the coming of the church, fascinating thing, they all drown like Pharaoh. So again, this sense the English have of themselves as a chosen people, the sense the Dutch have of themselves as a chosen people. This is part of the fabric of how all of us as Europeans conceive of ourselves. And of course, this has, has, has been for good. It has fostered, it's helped foster the astonishing civilizational achievements of, of the Dutch Republic in the, in the 17th century. But it's also not necessarily been positive for certain people in the rest of the world. So when the Dutch go to South Africa and they settle there, again, they consider themselves a chosen people. And this, of course, is bad news for the equivalent of the Canaanites, who find that their land has been given to people who are claiming it in the name of God. And again, over and over, and again, the English, you know, when they go to North America, when they go to South Africa, when they go to Australia, again, this is a part of the narrative that they also like to tell about themselves. And so the power of these stories has literally shaped the way that European history has evolved. They've been written and rewritten over again, kind of like palimpsests. And they, these stories continue to, I think, um, affect and shape the way that Europe functions uh, and has behaved over the course of the past few years. Um, you already mentioned the last, you know, the book culminates with, with Angela Merkel and, and Viktor Orban. Now, I do not think that Angela Merkel would have let a million people from a uh, different part of the world, different cultural background, into her country if she had not been raised in the, 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 um, the, the parsonage of her uh, Lutheran pastor father, learning not just, absorbing not just moral principles, ethical principles, but absorbing stories and Jesus, among many other things, Jesus has to rank as the most influential teller of short stories who's ever existed. And perhaps one of his most influential stories is the story of the Good Samaritan. The idea that we all have a responsibility to care for people who may be very different to us. And the power of that, the power of the moral teaching embedded in that story is implicit in the narrative. And it's something I think that, that um, historians, philosophers, even theologians may forget the power of a simple narrative. And yet that, that story, that parable that Christ told continues to reverberate into the present. But of course, again, there are many contradictory ways in which this inheritance of biblical narratives can impact on us. Because 
just as the Dutch at the siege of Harlem or the siege at Leiden saw themselves as a, a godly people resisting enemies who like the Midianites or the Assyrians or the Babylonians environ them around. So also for Victor Orban, uh, the leader of uh, a, a nation that had been occupied by the Ottomans for many centuries. So also was he able to draw on the, the biblical heritage to cast his people as a people environed around? Equally Christian, equally shaped by the power of Christian narratives, biblical narratives, but leading to very different conclusions, very different results. And I think that when you look at the totality of Christian and European history, what is striking is not just the potency of certain ideas, certain moral teaching, certain ethical teaching, certain ways of conceiving the world, all of which are hugely important, but it is also the power of narratives, the power of certain images. And we heard one of them in the, um, in the reading that this, this event began with. Um, in him, the word, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And those lines are, as so often in the New Testament, drawing on images and ideas in the old, and specifically the lines of Isaiah, that the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. They've been lost in, in the murk, and now illumination has come to them, enlightenment has come to them. And this is a, a, a way of seeing the world. The world is lost in darkness and light has come. That will inspire the very first generations of Christians to venture out into a world that they see as lost to idolatry and superstition and darkness and bring them light. And again, in the early Middle Ages when, say, people from, 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 from newly converted England come here, come to the Netherlands and plant their rough churches among the Frisian wilds, and then go further east again into the forests of Saxony, Boniface, um, man from my own uh, southwest of England, um, one of the very few saints to have had a nuclear power station named after him, I'm proud to say, um, <laughs> ventures into the forests of, uh, of Saxony and he chops down a tree, a great tree of Thunor, as an emblem of his, his, his determination to to destroy superstition, to uh, banish idolatry, and to bring the people who live in the murk of those Saxon forests into the light of Christ. And this becomes a crucial way in which the church, the medieval church, what becomes the Roman church over the course of the Middle Ages sees itself. It is a, a beacon of light. It is the enemy of idolatry. It is the enemy of superstition. But then of course in the 16th century, that gets turned against it. It's part of what, what, what is at issue when the, the, the Dutch and the Spanish are, are, are facing off against one another is that the, the Dutch Protestants have come to see the Church of Rome as the embodiment of, of superstition and idolatry. And for Protestants, the idea of enlightenment, the idea that the heart can be opened up to the spirit and light can blaze all around becomes a crucial part of their self-image. And over the course of the 17th century in the Netherlands, this is a fundamental concept. The idea that enlightenment can blaze amid darkness. And by the 18th century, this concept has come to be turned not just against the Roman church, but against the Christian church itself, against the very fabric of Christianity, against the very idea of what has come to be defined as religion. And the idea of the enlightenment, a blaze of light that all can access across the world from Shanghai to Lima is a crucial part of the way in which the philosophes and then the revolutionaries in France conceive themselves. And they see this as a new beginning, a bringing of the people who walked in darkness into light, a rejection of superstition, a toppling of idols. And yet even to put it in those terms, 
is to demonstrate how fundamentally Christian it remains. How deeply when we talk about enlightenment, when we condemn Christianity as superstition, when we say that we have, we have toppled the idols, we are just replicating themes and images and stories that go back over the 2,000 years of Christian history and back even before the coming of Christi Christianity to the writings of the Hebrew prophets. And I've increasingly come over the course of writing this book and then talking about it to think that um, it's almost impossible to escape this legacy, to stand outside it. The very process of trying to emancipate oneself from Christianity merely um, tangles one up in its web even more. Um, and whether that is something to be celebrated, I increasingly think it is, or whether it is something to be deplored is, is in a sense ir irrelevant. It is just, as I said, beginning. It is the waters in which all of us swim. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, Tom Holland, thank you. Um, Maybe you want a bit of water. The after. water of life. The, yeah. <laughs> um, in that sense, everything becomes symbolic. But um, <laughs> um, you are saying, um, among many, many other things, but um, that um, we cannot even begin to understand how much we have been shaped by Christian history, by the coming of Christendom, into the classical world and by the shaping of uh, the events around the year zero and the year 33 of antiquity and he I mean, the, the sort of the mingling of Roman and Greek traditions and Hebrew traditions into the church and to Christendom. Yes, I, I, uh, I, I mean the, 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 the frame, the, the background for my ending up wanting to write this book is that initially I, I did not have any great interest in Christianity. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that, that as, a, as a child, I kind of resented it. Uh, what I really loved was the glamour and the swagger of Rome. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved- It was your first the, bestseller, Rubicon. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I loved the yeah. gladiators, I loved the legions, I loved the emperors, I loved the purple, I loved the eagles and standards. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, a load of monks turn up and ruin it. Yeah. Um, and, there's a famous line of English poetry, um, the poet Swinburne puts into the mouth of Julian the Apostate, the uh, nephew of Constantine who, who tries to reverse the coming of Christianity. Yeah, and he, um, he, calls, he calls it the stinking herring of, uh, of Jerusalem, isn't it? Yes, Sorry. but his, supposedly yeah. his last, yeah. Yeah. He, he dies in a kind of terrible war in Persia, and yeah. his last phrase is supposedly, um, thou hast conquered Galilee and you have turned the whole world gray with thy breath. Yeah. And that was, as a child, very much the idea I yeah. had. That, and I kind of almost synesthetic sense that the world of Greece and Rome has bright skies. You know, the blaze of the Parthenon or yeah, the Colosseum. White marble. Or, yes, and white yeah. marble, which of course is also wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then, and then Christianity comes and the, the, the sun vanishes <laughs> behind dark cloud. And then the whole of the Middle Ages is kind of lowering. You've got this grey monk. Until you get here. to the Enlightenment in the 18th century and then the light comes back on. Mm. So it's a very, you know, I'm, I, I, I was very much um, persuaded by what I only gradually came to see as, as being a kind of fundamentally Christian myth that the Enlightenment tells about itself. Um, I was kind of totally bought into the idea that there was classical antiquity, which was light. Then there's murk and darkness. The Middle and Ages, then, yes, the Dark Ages, yes, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then there's the 18th century and the light switches go back on. Yeah. Um, now, it, it, it was precisely the fact that writing about the Romans, not as a child, but as an adult, required me to stare into the depths of this myth. Because even when I was writing Rubicon, and the conceit of Rubicon was that um, ancient Rome, the Roman Republic, held a mirror up to the American Republic, which at the time I was writing it had, was being hit by 9-11, uh, and then was gearing up to the Gulf War. Yeah. So there were lots of, of seeming parallels that I could kind of make play with. But it was it was kind of clear to me even when I was writing that that, that 
the world of Rome was kind of unimaginably and, and kind of innocently uh, callous compared to our own. Um, whatever um, you know, my, my friends thought about the Gulf War, going on the demonstrations against it, what struck me was, was, was how the, the enormous lengths that the, um, uh, the United States was going to not to kill people. Yeah. Whereas if, Julius if you, Caesar you was absolutely yeah. celebrating how many people he yeah, killed. Yeah, but you, you described that in Rubicon very, very vividly, how many people he killed and how he killed them. And, you know, it's monstrous. But, yeah. you know, there, yeah. there were, there were yeah. people in Rome who, who kind of raised eyebrows about this. But by and large, the reason that Caesar writes his commentaries and, and to frame the narrative is that he knows that people back in Rome want these kind of dramatic accounts of suffering and slaughter and endurance and ultimate triumph. Yeah. And it requires the slaughter and the enslavement of large numbers of people to demonstrate the quality of his heroism and to demonstrate to Rome that it has, has indeed triumphed over these kind of primordial and ancient enemies. And so you know, we, we, we do not have the equivalent of triumphs where people boast about how many people they've killed, how many people they've enslaved. And, and so as the more I... Um, you know, carried on writing about the, the ancient empires, the more this kind of niggled me. And I increasingly came to feel that essentially what had changed, certainly morally and ethically, is that Christianity essentially rewires the brain. But also... Rewires the brain. It rewires the brain. Kind of, it rewires the, the, the moral, the ethical assumptions mm -hmm. that, 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 that govern people. Yeah. So that that what the Romans assumed to be human nature and what we assume to be human nature is, is radically different. Mm -hmm. But more than that, 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 that our assumptions about almost every aspect of, of human existence gets rewired as well. And what I and, So and we have a different idea about what human nature is than the so. antiques. Yes, I yeah. think so, mm -hmm. yeah. But, but, but it's, it's, it's on the most fundamental level. It's, it's kind of, you know, you'd think that sexual desire is something that's kind of constant, everyone. But, but, but it, again, it gets wholly reconfigured, that our idea of time, the Romans had a kind of essentially a cyclical idea of time. We have, you know, it begins with Genesis, it will end with Revelation. A linear. Yeah, yeah. and so, so in Harlem, I was going to, um, to see an exhibition of, of, of paleo art, of, of the illustrations of, of prehistoric life beginning in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. When, of course, people, you know, it was this kind of great discovery that um, the world was much older than, than, than the Bible seemed to imply. And this is usually framed as, as a great challenge to Christianity, that, that the, the discovery of deep time and, and biblical history is seen as antithetical. But actually, I don't think so, because I think and without that sense of time as an arrow, having a start, having a finish, conceptually people in the early 19th century would not have been able to think of these strange bones that they were finding as belonging to creatures that had existed long before. So it's on that most kind of fundamental level. And if you like, that's the kind of equivalent of the radioactivity leak reaching Amsterdam. It's, it's kind of fading, but it's still the source is pretty clear, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, be, but because you, um, you... So you're actually saying that the idea of at least not trying to kill all your enemies and being kind to enemies certain is totally foreign to well. <laughs> empires before sort of the coming of Christ or the coming of the church it, it, there are certainly um, there are certainly people in so, so, so uh, Cato Caesar's enemy thinks that Caesar should be handed over to the Germans for betraying an oath and but there's a kind of element of yeah, politics about that. So it's not grounded in a kind of fundamental vision. The, the, what cha and again, I think it, it, it lies in, in a story. And it lies in a, uh, uh, the poetry and the symbolism of perhaps the key story in the Christian Bible, which is the story of the passion and the resurrection. And what Christianity does is to say that the cross, which is a kind of emblematic symbol of Roman power, it's, it's a symbol of the right of a governor to put to death 
anybody who opposes Roman power. He has the right to burn people. He has the right to throw them to the beasts. He has the right to crucify them. Yeah, and, that's and, and that's a real torture because you, yeah. pe people might not know this, but that is, you know, you're, not, you're not dying immediately. It's a long... Which is why torturous. it's worse yeah. than being burnt or being torn to pieces by lions. Yeah. Because it's not just that it's physically agonizing. It's, it's not just that... Um, you can't beat off the birds that are pecking at your eyes or attacking your genitals. It's that all this suffering is public and protracted. And in a society where dignity is, is, is of the essence, this kind of humiliating, protracted death, this death agony, is something that is seen as being paradigmatically uh, the fate of slaves. So it's the worst fate the most humiliating fate, the most socially degrading fate that you could possibly have. Yeah, you, you, in, in, the, in the first chapter of the book, you write about these sort of tortures, about the Greeks doing it to a Persian um, a nobleman at the at a rim of Europe, at the Bosporus, uh, and you describe also the, the tortures that Persian kings do to them. I mean, it's, if you, if, I, I truly recommend reading the book. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's really amazing, but you have to stomach the first two chapters. The, the torture is well, just... <laughs> I, 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 and it begins with an account of crucifixion. And the yeah. reason for that, it didn't originally, but I was about two chapters into writing it when I, I went it's to... It's gripping, though. I, mean, I went to, um, <laughs> to, 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 to Iraq to make yeah. a film about um, Islam, the Islamic yeah. State. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, I, I, I was in this shattered town where people had been, in, women had been enslaved, and uh, men yes, had been women, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and men had been slaughtered and, and, and crucified. Sinjar, yeah. And you know, I'd read a lot about crucifixion. I'd read a, a lot about Roman um, uh, power. I'd read a lot about how it was a given in antiquity that if you resist a Roman army, you know, or any ancient army then your women are liable to, um, to, to, to enslavement and your men are liable to be slaughtered and, and tortured to death. But to be in a town that had been flattened, that where bones still lay scattered around, and where the people who'd done this were kind of lying a mile or so away, absolutely within striking distance, and to know that people had been crucified opened this kind of great uh, kind of sense of moral, I don't know, uh, maybe even spiritual desolation because I realized how terrifying I found a world in which the cross did not have the signification that it has for us, even if you're not a, you know, a believing Christian. If you see a, a white van with a red cross pull up, you know that this is good news. You know, you, the cross is a symbol of the, the fact that in a sense, the, the, the weak will triumph over the strong, that the powerless have a kind of authority over, over the powerful. That, and, and to think that the cross might not have this significance, that it might be an emblem of what it was for the Romans. Of terror. The, 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 the power of the strong to torture and intimidate. Of terror, a symbol of Yeah, so, and so I felt this kind of incredible sense of gnawing dread in my guts. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not a kind of naturally mm -hmm. brave person. Mm -hmm. um, and... I, I, I found it a, a kind of profound experience. Um, so I came back and rewrote that. So, so I do think that, that, is, that, 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 yes, that the weirdness of that is, is really, really important. Now, the of weirdness of, wait a moment, we, we, we're dwelling on this because um, it's a Roman way of torturing the slaves and, and making you, and the, and, and making you uh, in public suffer. So your dignity is gone. Your 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 physical body is tortured. Your 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 even your even your spiritual dignity is gone because it's in public, and that fate is suffered by the Christian prophet. No? Well, he's not a prophet, though, is yeah. he? I mean, and and that's that's the weirdness of it because mm -hmm. the earliest person who we we know who who writes about it is Paul. Yeah, and Paul says he's 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 you know it's not a it's not a prophet. It it. Mm -hmm. It's the God of Israel yeah. who has also created the entire universe. Yeah. So it, it, the strangeness... So Paul says that this is a stump... The, the, this idea that the God of Israel 
I, and Paul isn't entirely sure quite what the relationship is between the son and the father. I mean, it, you know, there's no, lots, sort of later, lots to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. But, but his vague idea that, that in some way the, the God of Israel has, has died this monstrous On death. On the cross. Yeah. And he says, you know, this is a stumbling block to the Jews, which is putting it mildly. I mean, it's a massive stumbling block. And then he says, and it's madness to the Gentiles, by which he means essentially the Romans. And yeah, the absolutely, yeah. it's a stumbling block to the Romans. And it's not a stumbling block, the idea that a human can become a god, because this is, part of, again, part of the air of, of, what, of what the Romans breathe. And in fact, the fastest yeah, they're, growing... Yeah, Caesar's become gods. Yeah, huh? the yeah. fastest growing cult of the, of, of the first century AD is not Christianity, it's the cult of Augustus, yeah. who is the, first the son of a god. Julius yeah. Caesar has been deified. He, has, he is the son of a god. He's Divi Filius. He has brought peace to the world. He's brought, you know, a reign of peace. The swords have been beaten into plowshares. Um, so man becoming gods is sort of in a, the air. Yeah, not, no, 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 yeah. not an issue. And then he's, no. you know, when he dies, he ascends to heaven. He sits at the right hand of his father. So all this stuff is, is kind of, you know, it's not, it's not that odd. It's the same the narrative. the oddness yeah. is the fact that it's this guy who's died the death of a slave. That's the strangeness and that's the weirdness of it. And, and, and that's part of the rewiring because it is a God, so the highest principle, the Logos, the, the God who shaped the world, who actually made the world, who is the world, who's in the world, who dies on the cross to, and suffers the fate of a slave. Yes, and in the, in the, in the early, you know, so, so Paul clearly feels this is weird, this is shocking, this is terrible. Yeah. You know, I, you know, yes, I admit this is a, such a kind of mad thing to be saying. And still in the second century, you get Christians who say, yeah, this is, this is a terrible thing. This is what we believe, we believe this. And even uh, after Constantine converts, you know, and he sees a cross in the sky. And, and by uh, that he uh, wins the battle. Yes, right? yeah. um, but, but a century on, it's only then that we start to get uh, Christians portraying the cross. It's, it's, it's almost as though they can't bring themselves, you know, they can write about it, but they can't bring themselves to portray it. It's so awful. And when you do start to get images of Christ on the cross, he's portrayed as an athlete. He's buff, he's toned, he's got a kind of athlete's loincloth. He's, he's victorious. He's run in the, the race he's, and he's won the palm. Yeah, he's also a Polonian yes, figure. Yes, yes. Figure, yeah. And it's, it's only um, with the first millennium that you start to get images of, of Jesus dead on the cross. But why do, you, why do you think it's so essential and it's so telling, and you explain that very well in your book, but why do you think it's so telling that he suffers the, sort of the worst kind of fate? What, what's so weird about that? What's so, so essential about that? I, it, it, it's the sense of contrast between the you know, the God of Israel is not just any God. He is God. He, there is only the one God. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the sense of the fall, the sense of the humiliation, the sense of the humbling, and therefore the sense of the love mm -hmm. is stupefying to people who accept that this is what actually happened. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something overwhelming. And because this man who has been crucified under the power of Caesar on an implement of torture that is representative of the right of the greatest power in the world to, to manifest itself. That power is kind of subverted and it intrudes upon every conqueror, every king, every magistrate condemning a criminal to death who is a Christian, a kind of nagging anxiety that people previously had not had. And that anxiety is that actually those who suffer, those who are poor, those who are slaves, those who are criminals, might in some way be closer to God than the rich and the powerful. Now, human nature being what it is, this doesn't stop kings from being kingly and it doesn't no. stop magistrates from condemning people to death and it doesn't stop the rich from exulting in their riches. But it introduces a kind of a, 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 an anxiety that will run 
like a kind of psychic flame through the civilization that emerges out of the rubble of, of, of Roman power in the West, and indeed in the East, but, but, but let's talk about the West, because it's in the West that it takes on its, its, its peculiarly transformative effect. And, the, and, and by the 11th century, it's starting to, which is the period when you start to see Christ dead on the cross, Christ suffering on the cross. And it starts to feed into an idea that, um, that earthly greatness can and should be humbled in the cause of the service of God. And so you see you know, emperors kneeling in the snow. You see kings whipped through the streets of their, their own cities in the cause of affirming an idea that uh, there is a kind of sovereign way of structuring God's purpose on earth that is greater than that of earthly kings. Now, so God's, God's, um, um, uh, God is siding with the beggars and the lepers and the, and the so it, instead of with the, the gods of the ancients who are siding with the kings and the rich and the, that's, that's, that's sort of the, the turn you're it, describing, isn't it? It's the, it, 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 it yes, it's the a crucial re- the part of it, but, but, yeah. but, but of course it, it comes hedged about by paradox and, and, and ambivalence mm-hmm. and ambiguity because almost everything to do with Christianity is a kind of paradox. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've read um, a, a, a comic English science fiction novel called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, in which there is a spaceship that is powered by paradox. And I, Christianity is basically a spaceship that is powered by through time by paradox. <laughs> so the, 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 the paradox... Let's, so let's look at the 11th century when, when, when what happens is that you know, the, the, the Pope who humbles the emperor at Canossa, at Canossa yeah. he, he, he is doing this in the name of, of, of Christ, who, who likewise is seen as having humbled emperors. And this idea that light has to be brought into darkness fuses with, with an idea that um, the church has to be rendered pure of the, 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 the taint of, 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 of the earthly. And this enables people who've seized the commanding heights of the Roman church to push through something again that is, is, is wholly unprecedented. And that is the idea that, that's been a constant from Japan to the Atlantic across Eurasia, that the, if you're an earthly ruler, if you ha- you're an earthly autocrat, if you're then you have a right to poke your nose into the affairs of the, the supernatural as well that I mentioned. And whether you're in Japan, whether you're in China, whether you're in, in India or Islamic yeah, world or Byzantium, What's happening at Canossa is the, the Pope is saying, actually, earthly king, no, back off. There is, a, there is a purity, there is a sovereignty in the church that is greater than yours. You belong to the flux of what Christian theologians call the cyclum. The cyclum meaning the flux of things, what will rise, what it's, it's will, will, yeah, the will pass. Yeah, yeah. We in the church are the guardians of the religio, the bond between fallen man caught up in the cyclum and the eternity of the city of God. And the only way that this will work is if you back off. And so this is framed in, 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 in terms that draw on this kind of idea that, that the, in the, the humbling of Christ, that's his greatness. And it's greater than the power of any earthly king. And that's why Henry IV is, is, it has to be humiliated and humbled. And it's why when... Um, new institutions are planted that come to be called universities. The, the, the impulse behind this is a desire to, fry, to find ways of structuring this new kind of sovereign idea of the church. And they look, the, the lawyers look at the canons and they look at the, the decrees of the popes, and they, but they also look at scripture and they try to, they, f- they start to formulate an idea that if, if the, the, as Christ has said, the, um, the rich have a duty to care for the poor, then surely the poor have a right to what the rich are giving. Surely the poor have a right to, to food, to drink, to clothing, to shelter. And so this kind of radical idea that the poor as well have what will come to be called rights starts to bed itself down. Now, so far I'm aware that I've given a very eulogistic account of, of Christianity. But, of course, there are, you know, as I've said, there are paradoxes here. And part of the paradox is that this, 
this transformative way of seeing the world, which is founded on the idea that um, that empire is is something to be overthrown, that uh, a slave crucified by an empire is in some way God, nevertheless wishes to extend its power across the entire world. And Christ has spoken of his kingdom not being of this earth. And yet, as it turns out, <laughs> the church and uh, Christians who are enthused by this new vision of the church are actually quite keen on drawing their sword and extending their power. So this idea that, that the world needs to be purified leads to Christian soldiers sailing, marching, all the way to Jerusalem and drowning the seats of, uh, streets of Jerusalem in blood. And in due course, as this kind of card, you, you have um, armed warriors who feel pledged to put to the sword those who are the enemies of the, this Prince of Peace who died on the cross. And you also have emerging cadres of lawyers and intellectuals who come to regard those who are left behind as deplorables, if you like. You know, they, people, for instance, who live around Alby are people who are not accepting the latest cutting edge views of scholars trained in, in, in Paris or Bologna. Um, and so they have to be put to the sword. And then on top of that, there are people who feel that this hasn't gone far enough and that the, 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 the radicals, the revolutionaries have become the kind of the new elite. So the process of, of, of what these revolutionaries have been calling reformatio, the remaking of the world, needs to be pushed even further and they too come to be persecuted. So the paradox is that a, a, a revolutionary new way of seeing the world that has this image of a man tortured to death on a cross. And over the course of the Middle Ages, the portrayal of these tortures becomes more and more vivid, more and more unsettling. Nevertheless, ends up inflicting tortures on people in defense of a particular understanding of what this cross means. Yeah, so it's, um, but you're saying among many things that um, that the, the division of the religio and the secular is something which is, driven by the church, so it's not the worldly uh, kings. Who, yes. It's coming out of the church, this division, and the division is a new revolutionary thing around the, the year 1000, which shapes the modern world in many and, ways. And, uh, yes, yeah. and so it's drawing on, 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 on all the elements of theology that, that we talked about, but it's also drawing on something else in Paul's letters, which is a kind of radical new way of understanding what the proper relationship of men and women are. We, we're gonna, uh, I'm glad you mentioned it, because we're going to go back to Paul of Tarsus. Um, it's one of the main characters in your book, actually. Well, he's the only one who gets his, a, a, an entire chapter. Yeah, yeah. Um, 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 I noted that actually if I read it well, that the opponent of Paul of Tarsus is Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, in the way you constructed the book. Is that right? Do you see them as mirror images or enemies or I, I, black I, and white? Or it, 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 it's fabulous. You're the first person to have noticed that, 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 that they are the bookends, that Paul, with his, his, his saying that Christ's death on the cross is a scandal, appears in chapter three. And Nietzsche, who says something very similar, appears in uh, the third chapter from the end. It's right. a very kind of deliberate structure. I was wondering. <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah. so yes. So, so Paul and Nietzsche are the kind of the two bookends. And the the thing about Nietzsche is that by the end of the 19th century, people have become desensitized to the strangeness of Christ on the cross. Yeah. We, Everyone just accepts it. We're going to come to Nietzsche because because the Last half, the last third of the book is, well, not even, but it's, um, um, we come to Nietzsche, but first we have to establish a little bit more about Paul, about, you know, why um, Christianity and Christendom is so influential in the way the, we think. Um, we have had, we've spoken about uh, Christ suffering on the cross and how revolutionary that is and how repulsive, actually, to many, to the antiques and to, and how, how new and revolutionary that in many ways is. Um, there, are other, there, there are two more things I want to dwell upon why, um, and we have asked um, uh, Maureen Taven to um, uh, prepare two more texts. One is about, um, one we'd like to listen to now. It's, um, 
It's about um, it's a brief of uh, it's the letter of Paul of Tarsus to the Galatians, and uh, we're going to listen to it first and maybe um, talk about it a little bit more. Please, Maureen. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so many things in vain? If it really is in vain. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Thus Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see that it is men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are men of faith are blessed with Abraham, who had faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no man is justified before God by the law. For he who through faith is righteous shall live. But the law does not rest on faith. For he who does them, for he who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. That in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. To give a human example, brethren, no one annuls even a man's will or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, which is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance is by the law, it is no longer by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was ordained by angels through an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. 
For if a law had been given which could make alive, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture consigned all things to sin, that what was promised to faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were confined under the law, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed. So that the law was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. For in Jesus Christ, you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, as according to promise. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. <laughs> That's right. Can we have the, not the last sentence, but the four, the, but the one before that? Can we put it up again for one moment, please? Is that possible? Uh, anyway, it's the um, no. This um, no. The one after this one. Yeah. Um, we chose this passage, of course, because of this sentence. Um, it's a brief of uh, Paul of Tarsus to the Galatians. Uh, Galatian, Galatians, what's the, name? what's the English word? Galatians. Galatians. Gal um, and we have a, um, and you dwell on this quite long in the book. Um, we've, t we've spoken about uh, the Lord, I mean, God suffering on the cross. But, but this, is a, this is his first disciple, or sort of, uh, and is the founder of, of the Christian faith, Paul, in many ways. And um, he writes to this um, uh, uh, newly founded churches. The man went all over the Mediterranean uh, to found churches, which is totally amazing, and made possible by the Roman roads and the Roman peace and yeah. the Roman ships and the Roman yeah. shipping. and like, like, like the internet now. Yeah. <laughs> Created yeah. by the CIA to serve American impo you know, interests, has served many people who may not entirely be complicit with American yeah. power. So, exactly. Yeah. So, so the Romans uh, laid out these wonderful uh, roads and Paul of Tarsus uh, went over those roads and, 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 and I mean, he must have been an impressive man to, to sort of, uh, all where he came, you know, um, uh, make churches. I mean, and 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 con congregations of people who believed. I mean, amazing. I mean, like you say, amazing things of God suffering on a cross. I, but I, I mean, I, I remember when I was a boy, and we'd have um, a Bible reading from the Old Testament, a Bible reading from the New, and then a Bible mm -hmm. reading from the Gospel. And I, the Old Testament was usually quite interesting. It might involve kings being killed or tent pegs yeah. being driven through people's heads. You know, quite fun. Uh, the gospel, you know, you might get a good parable or something. A bit of wine. Usually, the New Testament reading was one of Paul's letters, and I would just switch off. I just think, wow, this is dreary. I've no idea what he's going on about at all. What's all this stuff about the law? Who cares? And it's only, it was only, um, I mean, you know, the more I reflected on it, that I realized that actually Paul's letters are the most influential works of literature I think ever written, the most, wow. the most influential documents. And they are like a kind of, almost every line is like a kind of acorn from which enormous oaks have, have grown and which you know, we now kind of live under their spreading branches. And this passage is, a, is an acorn that has given rise to a, a vast number of, of oaks. And it, it, it kind of goes back to the idea that, that we were talking about earlier, that when, when, when Paul says that, um, that the, 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 uh, the, the, the crucifixion is a stumbling block to the Jews. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews because Paul is saying that Christ's love, Christ's sacrifice, um, has, has, has served to redeem all of humanity. It's out of love for all of humanity. And therefore, a covenant has been established by God 
with, with, with all human beings whom he has created. And that, of course, means, well, what, what about the original covenant, which was you know, written down on tablets of stone and given to Moses? Um, and Paul is basically saying, we don't need that anymore, because now the law is written on the heart. And he, he, this is such a kind of weird thing for a Jew to be saying that Paul actually Paul uses... Paul is Jewish. Yes, Paul, yeah. of course, is a Jew. Yeah. And he, he, he reaches for a word that comes from the Greek Stoics. Who, and the Stoics believe that the divine is in everybody and therefore in every human being. And this spark of divine they call synodesis, which you might call conscience. And so Paul is saying basically that the Stoic idea of conscience is, is, is the law of God. And... If you accept Christ, if you love Christ, if you open your heart to the Spirit, then you will find the law of God written on your heart. And this is, is something that is open to everyone. It is open to Greek and it is open to Jew. It is open to free, it is open to slave, it is open to man, it is open to woman. All are joined in this one covenant. Now, the implications of this for the future are seismic because it means that in Christian civilization, unlike, say, in Islamic civilization, where Jews and Muslims believe that there is a body of law that has been given by God, which is kind of perfect. You don't need anything more than that. You can, of course, play with it. The, ra the rabbis of the Talmud do enormously. The scholars of, of the Sunnah do as well. But for Christians, what this beds down is the idea, firstly, that um, human law is something that can embody the will of God. So you don't need, you know, the, you don't need... Um, uh, Revelation. Uh, yeah. But, but, but also that because you look into your heart and the spirit progressively illumines it, therefore law can be progressive. So the idea so that... So law can change. Yeah, so law can change and, and, and it can approximate better and better and better over the course of time. And, and this, of course, again, is a really crucial idea that the idea that society, law... Uh, people's understanding of, of what is right can improve over time. The idea that to be progressive is a positive is something that goes back to these letters. So that, that, that we might say, yeah, that's a positive. But there is also a shadow to this, which is embedded in that phrase, there is no Jew nor Greek. Now, this is the underpinning of Western universalism, the Western universalism that we have today. This idea, and, and again, that is, is echoing the idea that, that you get in Genesis, that God has created every human being in his image, across the, e the entire and, and globe. Equal. Yes, and equal. Yeah. And, and so this is kind of, this is picking that up and running with it, and saying that, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, whatever, we're all equal. And of, of course, this again is, is a, a fundamental moral principle that, that we still uphold to this day. It's kind of what underpins um, our ideals as society. But the universal there, is, rights of man. there is a problem. Because if you're a Jew and you're being told there is no Jew or Greek, you might turn around and say, I don't want my distinctiveness as a Jew to be dissolved into a kind of universal mush. And that is actually what most Jews say. To Paul's enormous disappointment, most of his fellow Jews do not accept Christ as Lord. They want to remain Jewish. And so right from the very beginning, the very earliest Christian texts we have, this is an issue, a problem for Christian universalism. What do you do with people who may not want to be a part of the universal. And so what we were talking about with reference to heretics, with reference to, to you know, pagans, with reference to, to Muslims, of course, paradigmatically is true as well of, of the Jews. And so the history of Christianity's relationship to the Jews is also a fundamental part of this story. And also, um, because um, this is also the fundament, the fundament in many ways, to that there is no... I mean, this is quite revolutionary. There's neither slave nor free. I mean, in society. Christ Jesus. Yeah. So if, you, if you believe in him. Yeah. 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 I, but, but, Men and but, women. but as I say, these are acorns that will take quite a long time to grow. Because this, is, this is not saying slavery should be abolished. No. Um, but, but it is saying that there is a kind of moral e equality, that, that all are created equal, that over the centuries and over the millennia, like a kind of depth charge, 
the, the ripples from that kind of single detonation will ripple out in ways that over the course of time will kind of bring a lot of towers tumbling down. I mean, essentially, we, th this is one of, the, the, you know, one of the, the, the phrases that the whole of Western civilization is built on. But it's the, equiv you know, it, it's the equivalent of the San Andreas Fault. Yeah. So Western civilization is like San Francisco. Every so often, it shakes. It's going to shake. Things are going to come down. You're going to have to rebuild. Yes, because, because um, and you pointed out very well in the book as well, because the coming of the universal idea of Christianity, which is um, a universal idea, that's also why you call it dominion, it's, yeah. it's universal, uh, brings with it the divisions who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. So and what do you do with people who are wrong? Yeah. What yes. you do, and that you uh, uh, normally kill them. Yes. Well, yeah. not, not, not always. Not necessarily, not, not, not but often. Not necessarily. Yeah. You might, yeah. I, I mean, the, the earliest example we have of um, a Christian leader uh, basically losing patience with people who refuse to accept the, 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 the peace of, uh, uh, of Christ is Charlemagne. Yeah, or, who is, yeah. um, you know, Boniface goes into the forests of Saxony and chops down a tree to try and make his, his point. When this doesn't work, Charlemagne launches a full-out war of conquest, yeah. which involves an enormous amount of slaughter. Um, and Alcuin, his, uh, his, his kind of kind of conscience, if you like, his synodesis, um, his minister says, of education. Uh, you know, <laughs> whoa, hold on, uh, I'm not sure that this should be happening. And, and, and that articulates a kind of dialogue within Christianity that, that, that reappears over and over again. Uh, it, it's there when the Spanish go to, um, go, to, go to America and you get people like Las Casas saying, Oh, you know, actually, um, if we God has created all of no. human beings, then these Indians have rights as well, and we shouldn't be doing this. Um, and I think that you, you know, you get it. Um, I think, I mean, I think the Gulf War is a kind of illustration of that. It, 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 for, for, for Bush, it was about spreading a, a kind of universalist idea. He, you know, he, he's a devout Christian, but I think he, th he, he thinks that um, value, the values he holds are authentically universal, and he believes that as passionately as, as any medieval pope or any uh, conquistador. Um, and likewise, people you know, who, who demonstrated, who opposed the war, were, you know, were like Alcuin, kind of saying, well, I'm not sure whether, whether, this, you know, whether we should bomb people into accepting our values like this. And this is a dialogue that's, that's been going on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what matters more, to bring people into the light of Christ or to bring people into the light of kind of universalism or to bring people into a proper uh, liberal attitude? Or what do you do? Um, we haven't talked about, uh, before I come back to, to uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and the ending of the book, um, we have one more fragment to listen to, um, which I, um, it's uh, uh, Augustine, uh, St. Augustine's sermon on John 6. Um, and we've chosen it because um, you probably know um, it's the motto of the book. And it says, uh, uh, a love and do as you will, St. Augustine. That's the motto of the book. And um, that's the third aspect of um, um, the book and maybe of the, 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 the coming of Christendom we want to talk about. Uh, please, Maureen. Yes, thank you. All who do not love God are strangers and antichrists. They might come to the churches but I cannot be numbered among the children of God. That fountain of life does not belong to them. A bad person can have baptism and prophecy. King Saul had prophecy. Even while he persecuted the holy David, he was filled with the spirit of prophecy and began to prophesy. A bad person can receive the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord. For it said, all who eat and drink unworthily, eat and drink judgment on themselves. A bad person can have the name of Christ and be called a Christian. Such people are referred to when it says, they polluted the name of their God. 
To have all these sacraments is, as I say, possible even for a bad person. But to have love and be a bad person is impossible. Love is the unique gift, the fountain that is yours alone. The Spirit of God exhausts you to drink from it. And in so doing, to drink from himself. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's the motto of the book, and there's a whole part on the Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> all you need is love. All you need is love, yeah. yeah. Um, is this so um, crucial to... So crucial that it's the motto of the book? Well, you could see some of the, some of the, again, the paradoxes there. Yeah. Um, Augustine is, is writing about the importance of love, but he's saying people who don't love are, are kind of anti Christ. Yeah. So, so, you know, love people or I'll kill you is a, you know, I mean, again, a, a kind of running <laughs> paradox that goes through Christian history. Um, and I, I, I think that. Um, when, when the Beatles sang All You Need Is Love, they did it as part of a satellite link-up. It was the very first global satellite yeah. link-up. So people across the world would do it. Out of every row. Out of fact, they did that. They said this was Britain's contribution, um, the Beatles singing All You Need Is Love. And the Beatles sang it because they assumed that this was a given, that everyone would accept that All You Need Is Love, you know, what's wrong with that? But actually, it's reflective of, of again, deeply Christian assumptions that the Beatles, even though John Lennon had famously said that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus, um, they, you know, they were, they, they'd all been raised in kind of Christian assumptions. They'd all just absorbed it. You know, th again, this is kind of the radioactivity idea. It was just kind of part of what they were. Um, they just and, assumed and, that everybody and, would... Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and they sing this in 1967, which is remembered as the summer of love. Um, and I think that, that, that in, in, in 100 years' time, the summer of love and the 60s will be seen as a decade as, as, as crucial to the history of Christian civilization as the 1520s and 30s were. So the, 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 the decade that sees the kind of explosion of the, of the Reformation. And I think that the, the 60s is the a 15, kind 20, of... The 1520s, you mean when Martin Luther... Yes, could, and, yeah, and that, yes, yeah. yes. And... and, yeah. and I mean, that may seem a kind of big, a, a big claim to make, but if you think about the, the, the scale of the moral, the ethical transformation that's happened, um, you know, in, 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 um, in, in 1950, homosexuality was illegal across um, much of the West. Now it's illegal to be opposed to Christianity, pretty much. And to so opposed that's, to homosexuality. And, and, yeah. and so yeah. that's a really profound yeah. transformation. And this is often seen as expressive of, of the, a kind of really profound repudiation of Christianity, kind of society, you know, the West's final emancipation from Christianity. But predictably, maybe, <laughs> I see it in slightly different terms, you know, another paradox, that this is actually just another convulsion, this process of reformatio, whereby um, patterns of behavior, the desire to remake the world in the name of love generates kind of explosive effects that the 60s is another kind of shaking of the San Andreas Fault, if you like. And the, the pre-tremor of the 60s is the civil rights movement in America. Martin where, Luther King yeah, Jr. Yeah, and, and this is happening against, you know, the, the backdrop of, of the Second World War and the Nazis. And the Nazis are the first political regime since Constantine, consciously to repudiate certain Chris fundamental Christian values. So unlike the French Revolution, unlike the, 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 the Russian Revolution, which affirms the idea that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, that the, 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 the weak have a moral quality that is greater than that of the strong, and also are profoundly universalist, that there is no Jew or Greek. These are principles that the, that, that the, 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 the French and the Russian revolutionaries absolutely uphold. The Nazis, of course, do not. The Nazis um, completely think that uh, the first should remain first and the last possibly should be eliminated. And they certainly don't think that there is no Jew or Greek. They think that, you know, that they're so opposed to that idea that they end up trying to, to, to wipe the Jews out. And in the wake of, of, of that, 
the, 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 the shock is felt in Europe and the United States so profoundly that I think it effectively, it means in a way that you almost don't need confessional Christianity anymore. Because if you want to know, as someone born in the West, what is the right thing to do, you no longer need to look at the figure of Jesus. You no longer need the church or the Bible. All you have to do is to look at the Nazis and say, well, we will do whatever the opposite is. It's, it, it's still a kind of Christianity. I mean, it's a shadowy form of Christianity because the Nazis offend us because they have offended against these fundamental Christian dictates, which have been part of Western assumptions for 2,000 years. But you don't need overt Christianity. And so this is part of the flux that will emerge in the 60s. But the other is that in the 50s, Martin Luther King, who is a Baptist who speaks with the cadences of the Bible, he summons white Americans to recognize their kinship with black Americans. If there is no Jew or Greek, then there is no black or white. And he does this in the name of a savior who he says is an extremist for love. And the fact that this is happening, you know, a decade or so after the opening of the death camps in, in Europe means that it, it, it has a kind of peculiar moral urgency. And so the, the civil rights movement basically succeeds. And it's, it's yet another example of the way in which Christianity serves to reform society. It's another iteration of reformatio. And, and you might think that this shows that in the wake of the, of, of the Second World War, that the confessional Christianity, institutional Christianity, will continue as it has always done, like a kind of Catherine wheel throwing out these sparks. And that will be the main focus of, of the West. But what actually happens is something slightly different, which is that other groups of people take up the, 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 the model of what, of what Martin Luther King has done with race and does it with gender and with, with sexuality. So you get feminism and you get gay rights campaigners. And for, 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 for confessional Christians in the United States, this is more unsettling because they can entirely accept that there should be no black or white. This is, you know, f from, from Genesis through to Galatians, this is really fundamental. But they have been taught that uh, in the marriage between a man and a woman, a man should be the head and have the headship over woman. And so the claims of women to an equality with men, they find unsettling. And even more, the idea that, that homosexuals should have an equality with heterosexuals, because they know that uh, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, has said, you know, condemns the fact that Roman men sleep with men and that Roman women sleep with women. And so, over the course of the 60s, into the 70s, into the 80s, and now right the way into the present. What has happened is a sense of a widening fracture between confessional Christians and people who you might define as progressives, liberals, secularists, whatever. And feminism and gay rights have been the kind of battering rams that have seemed to widen this division. But it's more complicated than that. And it's more complicated, in, in I think, in two fundamental ways. The first is that the inspiration for both these movements is clearly the civil rights movement. And it's accepted because enough men accept the justice of feminism, enough het heterosexuals accept the justice of, 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 of gay rights campaigners. And they do that because the idea that actually a kind of, you know, we should love one another and that those who have been downtrodden should be raised up and that those who've been last should be first remains part of the air that we breathe. And so people accept the fundamental justice of this. The other reason is that actually, although Paul says that, um, that the man is like Christ in a marriage and that the woman is like the church, and that might seem massively sexist to our eyes, in fact, by the standards of, of Roman sexuality, this is radically liberating. To a Roman, what matters is that you are free and a citizen and male and powerful, and then you can do whatever you like you to anyone it. else. Yeah. Anyone else. And Paul is saying, no, this is not acceptable. You know, men have to exercise continence, um, and you have to respect women's bodies because they have, they have kind of a bodily integrity. Uh, a woman's body is her own. And you, you know, if you are a, a, a Christian, you can't just go around 
shagging the scullery maid or the page boy or whatever. You know, it's uh, un unacceptable. So, so, so that sense of the, the dignity of uh, the female body, which is, which is a crucial part of, of feminism, I think, again, you know, it's, it's one of these oaks that has sprung from, from the acorns that are lying around in Paul's letters. In Paul's letters, yeah. And so also is the very concept and category of homosexuality. Because that, those two lines that I mentioned, Paul saying in a kind of almost throwaway way, way to the Romans that uh, there are men who sleep with men and that there are women who sleep with women. This, as far as I know, is the only passage in ancient literature that posits the idea of kind of same-sex attraction as a, as a distinctive category. Of course, the Romans understand that there are men who like women and men who like men. Um, but for them, it's kind of like, you know, you like blondes or you like brunettes. It's a kind of interesting foible, but it's, it, 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 it's not fundamental. And likewise, of course, you know, in... in, in, um, in uh, in the Mosaic law, there are penalties against men sleeping with men, but it, it's not framed as being a uh, same-sex attraction. It's a kind of specific sex act that a man does with, a, with another male. So that Pauline category, again, is something, uh, it, you know, it's another of these acorns. It's something very, very radical and original. And it, it, the measure of how radical is that it takes a thousand years, really, before a name is invented which kind of approximates to it. And that name is sodomy, which derives from a teaching of Gregory the Great in the 6th century that the sin of Sodom, which gets wiped out by the anger of God, was same-sex relations, even though there's no evidence for that in Genesis at all. And Aquinas in the 13th century in his kind of great philosophical magnum opus, says that, yes, sodomy is men sleeping with men, women sleeping with women. But it, it, it still remains a very unstable category right the way into the 19th century. Sodomy can mean masturbation or bestiality or a man having anal sex with a woman. I mean, it can mean a whole host of different things. And it's really only with the Darwinian idea that sex has an evolutionary purpose that you get people who start to look at sexuality in a scientific way and the, the key person who does this is a, a, a German-Austrian um, psychologist called Kraft Ebbing. And he um, is a devout Catholic, but he's also a scientist. And so he takes up this word that in German is coined in, in the 1860s, and he popularizes it in a whole host of, of European languages. And for Kraft Ebbing, a, a, a homosexual is someone who is, you know, it's not like sodomy, it, sodomy is an act. Homosexuality is is a condition, and this is what he he starts to, um, to you know, in his his sexopathia sexualis. This is w how he defines it. But the publication of this means that he gets written to by lots of people who come to define themselves as homosexual. They're grateful for this 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 kind of neologism, this this novel description, and they say to him, "I'm so glad you understand me. I want what 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 men and women have. I want a stable relationship." So what they are wanting is, is the equivalent of a Christian marriage, Christian monogamous relationship. And Kraft Ebbing is, is sufficiently a Catholic that by, you know, this is, he comes to see homosexuality as, 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 as basically being a fusion of the Christian sin of sodomy and the Christian virtue of monogamous love and marriage. And this so you, becomes such a, the moment it gets kind of introduced into the bloodstream of, of Christian Europe, Everyone accepts it for granted, together with the, the equally radical notion of heterosexuality. And then it spreads very rapidly. So it's one of the most influential Christian categorizations that's ever been coined. So, Again, you know, the, yeah. in the Muslim world, in China, in, you know, I mean, everywhere, people kind of accept it. So in the 60s, when, when you start to get gay liberation, the, the, the challenge for Christians is what are you emphasizing? Are you emphasizing the sin? Or are you emphasizing the love? The love? Yeah. Uh, and again, it, 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 it's not a coincidence that legislation for gay marriage has happened, I think, almost entirely exclusively in Christian majority countries because the very notion of homosexuality is one that Stems. has sprung from this Christian seedbed. You, um, you, you are um, you're saying that... Uh, the idea of um, secularis secularization of the idea of love, like the Beatles bring it, is an another transformation of 
the whole um, uh, Christian categories or way of, of, of thinking, but... Kind, ki kind of. I mean, I, I think that the way in which the 60s is a kind of repudiation of Christianity is manifest in that idea of, of the summer of love. Yeah. Because for Martin Luther King, idea love is what it is for, for Luther and for, uh, for, um, for Paul you're... and Augustine and Luther. But... It, it's a spiritual love. But, but of course, for the Beatles, and particularly, say, for the Rolling Stones or, or, or Jim Morrison, love is all about shagging groupies. Yeah. And um, in the summer of love, the, the, there's a kind of radical sense that actually Christian sexual morality is, is repressive and uptight. And you know, the idea that Christians are like blue meanies coming along and spot, you know, stopping hippies from having their fun. Yeah. And the idea beds down over the course of the 70s. And I guess Amsterdam is a kind of paradigmatic illustration of that. This Calvinist city that suddenly decides, whoa, we're going to have a massive red light district and whoa, prostitution, woohoo. And, 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 and this becomes an index of, of Amsterdam's liber liberal character. It's, you know, this is the most liberal city in the world. You can wander around and see prostitutes standing in windows. Woohoo. But, and so I, I, as I was writing the book, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to have to acknowledge that. That is a real repudiation of, of, of Christian sexual ethics. But then as I was writing it, the Harvey Weinstein affair broke in America. And what nobody asked about that was, well, what's the big issue? Why shouldn't a powerful man um, sexually use his, his subordinates? And the reason nobody asks that is because we are so saturated in Christian assumptions that the very idea that the Romans had that, that a powerful man has this right is something that's become anathema to us. It's rewired, and, it's yeah, rewired and like so you the said Me in the beginning so of the brain. Me Too movement but, but works because you know, men, men, men accept it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm, last, last uh, uh, part of the conversation, you, 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 just, you just said that indeed you constructed the book between Paul of Tarsus and Friedrich Nietzsche, um, because Nietzsche is very, very, I mean, he, he declares that God is dead, and uh, God has been murdered, or he's, he's, at least he's no longer there, and he, and he hates Christ. He's okay with Christ. Uh, even Nietzsche doesn't go so far as to diss Christ too badly, well, if you but who he really disses is Paul. Yeah. Paul of Tarsus, but as but Hitler does as well, as, as Hitler does as well, and that's interesting because you're saying you're writing here that um, that Nietzsche says you, you're quoting Nietzsche that he um, um, that he says well if if God's dead then we have a real problem with morality you know then then there's no morality anymore and um, and then the book goes on in, into the Third Reich and to the Nazis who like you just said before who um, take actually the, um, the Christian faith very seriously in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the respect that they think it's the opposite of what they want. So they, uh, yeah. so they um, and you seem to say there that um, where does this Christian faith come from, which, um, which um, helps the poor and, and thinks that the weak are uh, uh, an example to the strong and should be held upon the uh, to 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 shown, shown. Um, where it does come from of course from the Jews so the Jews need to be killed yeah and, and I've been talking about Christianity as a history of paradoxes yeah. and I think this is the most grotesque paradox in the whole of uh, of, of Christian history so is, in, is, in, is in many ways the Nazis are taking Paul of Tarsus and Jesus Christ very, very serious as well, their enemies, as their real enemies. You see, even the, again, even, e even the Nazis can't bring themselves to diss Jesus. So they're quite keen on the idea that Jesus was an Aryan, that perhaps he was the son of a, 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 you know, a Germanic centurion or someone. So they, they, they give Jesus as a kind of honorary Aryan status. But they have no doubt that Paul is a Jew. So he's always the Paul Jew, the, the, the Jew Paul. And Hitler in particular is, is, is very anxious about this because Hitler sees both the Greeks and the Romans as being of Nordic stock. Hitler has no time for kind of Himmler's obsession with picking up crap German pots, you know, which don't measure up at all. Hit, hit, Hitler is into the Parthenon and Augustus. And in fact, you know, he, he, Hitler is so obsessed by Augustus that um, 
1938 when it's the uh, 2000th anniversary of, of Augustus's birth and Mussolini puts on a great exhibition in Rome. He goes three times to see it, which, you know, Hitler doesn't really like traveling very much. He, you know, it's quite, quite something. And Hitler, Hitler fe- he says, well, you know, what went wrong with, with the Greeks? What went wrong with the Romans? And he says, basically, they got corrupted by, by Paul. Paul turns up, this but, Jew, but, but a Jew. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and Paul's teachings is like a cancer that rotted the, you know, the, 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 the ferocity, the, the cruelty, the power, the authority of the Greeks, of the Romans, their commitment to racial purity, their, 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 their emphasis on strength. And this is kind of bastardized Nietzscheism because, of course, Nietzsche um, hates Christianity because it praises the weak, because it gives weak the weak a, 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 a power over the strong. That's what he hates, and that's that's kind of what Hitler hates about it as well. And so he, Paul, teaches that a, a man who died on a cross is 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 somehow God, and therefore there is strength in weakness, and this is a cancer. And Paul also teaches, as we saw, that there is no Jew or Greek. And this is massively a cancer because Jews and Greeks have to be kept apart. And so um, when Hitler talks about founding a thousand year Reich, which of course is, is, a, is an echo of revelation, the idea, you know, I mean, that's what, so there are Garden certain, there, even in the Nazis, there are Christian echoes. And of course it's drawing on anti-Semitic traditions within Christianity as well. But, Fundamentally, Hitler sees Christianity as proof of what the Jews at their most dangerous can do. And if his Reich is to last a thousand years, unlike Greece, unlike Rome, then they have to get rid of the Jews. Because if they don't, someone like Paul will emerge and destroy the Reich from within. And it's the most horrible paradox that the Jews get killed because Hitler blames them for Christianity. And on that so bombshell. On that, on that wonderful, um, we could have talked about communism as a new way of um, reinterpreting the Christian values. We could have talked about many, many other things. We could have talked about enlightenment. We could have, I mean, the book is an endless source of conversation. Um, and you've done your utmost best to shed some light on it. Thank you very, very much for all your talking you. and your uh, thoughts. Um, there might be anybody who is willing to um, join in the conversation or have a question. A question is a question and not a long expose. Um, uh, it has a question mark at the end of the first sentence. Um, <laughs> let's see whether there's um, anybody who wants to join in. Um, I see somebody over here, yes. I, I will okay. hold it for you uh, uh, Tom, be, to make sure it's one sentence. Uh, th- <laughs> okay, uh, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do you account for the fact that the uh, German army uh, uh, used the Christian cross, a, a barely redesigned Malteser cross, the Balkan Kreuz, which is just a sans serif version of the Malteser cross in typographical yeah, yeah. term? How do you account for that? Thank you. Uh, Himmler. Himmler um, uh, hated Christianity even more than Hitler, and he set himself uh, when 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 the Nazis had won the war, he 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 planned out a, a forty or fifty year program, uh, essentially to eradicate um, everything within Christianity that he he, he despised and and hated. Um, but the Nazis were content to have a kind of Christianity that would sustain and support um, the Reich and the principles of fascism. And so to that end, they were happy, for instance, to, um, to sponsor uh, Lutherans, perhaps, who, um, who might emphasize the more anti-Semitic elements of, of Luther's own pronouncements on, on, on the Jews. And in fact, they convened a, a, a conference in the Wartburg where uh, Luther had translated the New Testament into German, where 
they effectively disposed of the Old Testament from the biblical canon. And this was a, 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 a temptation that had been there almost from the beginnings of Christianity. Because in the second century there, there was a, 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 a Christian called Marcion who had proposed that the God who was the father of Christ could not have been the God of the Old Testament. And therefore that the Old Testament should be got rid of. And again, the Nazis are interested in this idea and they're interested in a Christianity that's been purged of its uh, Jewish elements. In the book, I, I, I mentioned in, in the talk I gave at the beginning that I, um, I talked about um, Tolkien and the Second World War. And t Tolkien is the prism through which in the book I discuss the Nazis and the Holocaust. And I was, I was nervous about whether this, you know, you know is this strong enough to bear this weight? But actually, um, you know, Tolkien had, had fought in the Battle of the Somme uh, opposite Hitler. Hitler had been on the other side. Um, and his son uh, was in the RAF in the war and had been, um, therefore, part of, of the Air Force that had, had flattened Hamburg and would, would flatten Dresden. And, and so Tolkien was, was, was very aware of um, the, the cruelties and the horrors of the early 20th century. And was also a devout Catholic. And the Lord of the Rings may seem to be about um, you know, kind of fantasy of, of elves and you know, hobbits and things. But it is a surprisingly, I think, profound meditation on the darkness that lay at the heart of um, of European Christian civilization. And Tolkien was against the firebombing of Hamburg because he did not see the Germans as the enemy. He saw the evil that was in all human beings and therefore within the RAF pilots as well. And so this is what he writes to his son warming against it. And I think that the most vivid image I can give of what the Nazis planned for Christianity is that they wanted it to become like the ring wraiths were to Sauron. Corrupted, transformed, turned into servants of you know, what the Nazis, of course, saw as, 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 as the light. But by a Christian light would have been an, an utter darkness and an utter, uh, you know, an utter repudiation of everything it was. Um, so, 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 so the cross, the, the use of the cross is, is an attempt to, you know, it's kind of like giving, you know, the sons of man rings and turning them into, into wraiths and servants of the darkness. Into the opposite, actually. Yeah. 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 Mm. Over there, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your metaphor of the acorns um, that Paul uh, was spreading around the world. Um, and I was wondering if, if you would, would, would take that metaphor uh, and, and, and look at the trees that have sprung out of it. Could you foresee a scenario in which those trees would eventually die? And what would that look like? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the, 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 the question that, that Nietzsche posits. Um, Nietzsche is contemptuous of the idea that effectively you can have Christian values and ethics if you've lost Christian belief. And he's contemptuous of, of most philosophers as just being priests. And he's contemptuous of, of humanists and socialists and communists likewise as essentially being, being Christians. Um, Nietzsche wants um, a, 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 a kind of a recognition that God is dead that that corpse is dead, and he doesn't want the, the flickering shadows to, to continue to play. But even Nietzsche didn't know what this would look like. And he says repeatedly that, um, that when people discover that God is dead and they have to abandon uh, Christian ethics and values and together with Christian belief, then great horrors will be thrown up and it will, it, it will be transformative. And Nietzsche, of course, is writing that before the Nazis. So it's impossible to read those lines and not think about what was coming up you know, a few decades after Nietzsche's death. So when Nietzsche says that, that the corpse of God lies in the cave and is casting shadows, I think that, that 
the modern West's horror at Nazism is that shadow. We look at the Nazis and we do whatever the opposite of the Nazis do. That's, that's, that's how we get our kind of moral sense. But I think that the power of that is fading. And I think a large part of, of the kind of convulsions, that are, moral convulsions that are afflicting the West and the feeling that liberals in particular have that actually, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps liberals felt the world is going to be liberal. I don't think liberals feel that now. And so the, um, the, 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 the challenge of justifying liberalism in a way that goes beyond saying that if you don't accept liberal precepts, then you're a Nazi, that's proving inadequate. And so I think that I can envisage three possible ways in which the West might evolve morally. The first is that um, actually it turns out that, that liberalism, that the, the kind of after effects of the 60s revolution have, are, are self-sustaining. That they, they, you know, they're kind of like, you know, go back to the metaphor of a rocket ship, that, that doctrinal Christianity was the kind of booster that got it, got lift off, and now it's, it's escaped the atmosphere, and it doesn't need that anymore, and it can discard it, and it will just continue to, to go across space, and everything will be fine, and it's got enough fuel to keep it going. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is, as Nietzsche said, that as Christian belief declines, so Christian ethics and, 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 and morality will decline as well, and I don't think it will be Nazism, but, but elements of fascism will return, a kind of a, a way that privileges the power of the strong over the weak and the power of the group over the universal. And that the Christian assumption that uh, the weak have a, a, a kind of moral claim on the strong and that uh, there is no Jew or Greek will go. And um, the West will become increasingly uh, in hoc to uh, strong men and to uh, nationalism and perhaps to ethno-nationalism. So that, that's another way it might go. And a third way is that, which I guess you know, is, as I suppose, where I've gone, the path I've taken, which is to, uh, you know, I've be become more and more anxious about why it is that I believe what I believe and the, 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 the kind of cultural contingency of it. And I've followed the thread back and I've, it's taken me, you know, yeah, to this, you know, the, the trace the origins of these oaks and I find them in the kind of the acorn scattered in, in early Christianity. And um, I, I, you know, I, I would basically, I'm very happy now to identify as Christian because I think that it's a stronger way of upholding things that I believe than to say that I'm a liberal. And it may be that um, this is something that, that, that as Western power retreats, as it becomes more and more clear that things that, that, that liberals have assumed were universal are in fact not universal at all, but are bred of the specific circumstances of Christian history that perhaps people will go back to in the West to Christianity. And it's important to emphasize that although the, the narrative in the West is all about Christianity's decline, in a global scale, it's not in decline at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's sweeping Africa, it's you know, huge, Plant, planting large numbers across Asia. So Christianity retains its kind of incredible uh, fire gust, its ability to spread across the world, but maybe that fire will reignite in the West. Um, so those are three alternatives, I would guess. Thank you. I think we're going to go for the two last questions. If you put them together, then. Um. Um. I found it really interesting what you talked about Jesus, how he was uh, kind of humble and that was kind of redefined, uh, you know, Western culture. So my question for you is, if we look at modern day Western culture, are there any leaders who have these, maybe you see some leaders that have the same qualities or the same possessions of character as Jesus? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I, and, and I don't think that there's ever... You see, what, 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 what this book does not do is engage with the question of who the historical Jesus was. And, and it's a huge relief because this is the kind of bog of bogs. I, I had some experience of how treacherous these, these grounds can be when I wrote about who I thought the historical Muhammad was. Jesus is, is even more difficult in a way. Um, but what I do think about the, the figure of Jesus in the four canonical gospels 
is that if, if they do not uh, reflect um, a, a real person, if they, they do not hold a mirror up to the historical Jesus, then he, he, he is the most astonishing fictional character ever created. Because imagine the uh, commission you would have to give these four not very talented writers. We need you to give a portrait of a man who's going to suffer a horrible death, a humiliating death, who is God. And he's got to tell the most amazing stories that will continue to be told. And everything he does has to have the quality of the strange and the unsettling. And he has to appear convincing as a man who is also a god in continents that you four evangelists cannot imagine and in 2,000 years' time. That's a hard ask. <laughs> and so the strangeness of Christ, and, and I've, we've very much been talking about Paul and not really the figure of Jesus, but actually... That's also because in the book you don't... Yeah, you don't but, but because, I, because I'm, I, 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 I'm not qualified to discuss no. you know, what the relationship it's of the Gospels is. It's a history of idea is. book and it's not a... Yeah. But, but, but the strangeness of Christ in the Gospels is incredibly significant. And the fact that, that you know, as I said at the beginning, that, that, that whoever, whatever the, the, the Jesus of the Gospels is, he is the greatest short story, the teller of stories, short stories who's ever lived, the most influential one, is a crucial part of, of, of the whole. And yet there is even more than that. And yes, Jesus is humble. He tells, his, you know, tells Peter to put up his sword. He... He, 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 he accepts death at the hands of the Roman state. But he's not just humble. He's terrifying as well. There's a quality of fear and terror about him as well. And there can be no one like Jesus because Jesus is unique. And that is the whole point. If you're a Christian, that is the whole point. But I think even culturally, there is no one like him. Last question. What advice would you give to European leaders facing a Europe with so many challenges right now, given the thesis of Europe, Europe's past? Well, um, I, 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 think that, that I, think, I think that European leaders have faced a huge problem because since the war, Europe has, has effectively ceased to be a kind of Christian monoculture. Of course, you know, there, were, there were always Jews, populations of Jews. But by and large, Europe was, was, was a kind of monoculture, whether it was Christian or whether it was post-Christian. Obviously, since the, uh, the war, that has changed, and European states have now become multicultural states, multi-religious states. And the way that, that um, the European states have, have dealt with that is to pretend that the idea of the secular, the idea that there is a kind of neutral space and that there are things called religions that exist separate to the secular space, is a neutral one. In fact, it's not remotely neutral because, you know, as we were talking about in the 11th century, the, the, this emergence of the idea of, of there being a dimension of the seculum and a dimension of, of, of the church which, which controls religio over the course of the millennium that follows emerges to become what we now think of as the secular and religion. The deal that is given to European Muslims as it was given to European Jews in the 19th century is that they can have freedom of religion, provided that they identify themselves as belonging to things that are called religions. So the Jews had to, in the 19th century had to stop thinking of themselves as they had always done, as belonging to the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, and they had to start thinking of themselves as belonging to a religion called Judaism, a word that Christians had coined in the second century, but no Jews had used until the 19th century. And so equivalently, Muslims have to think of themselves not as belonging to an ummah, not as belonging to a global community of Muslims, but as citizens of nation states who belong to a religion called Islam. And this is what it is to belong in a secular state. This is why European leaders in the heyday of the kind of the, you know, liberalism up, up until, let's say, 9-11 and then even after that, was so reluctant to talk about Europe's Christian heritage. 
Because to do that would draw attention to the way that, that, that what, for the effective functioning of, of the multinational, the multi-ethnic state, the multicultural state, the secular needs to pretend to be neutral isn't at all. And so I can understand why, you know, the notoriously in the preamble to the, um, the Lisbon Treaty, initially it said Europe derives its values from Greece and Rome and from the Enlightenment and left you know, a fairly sizable chunk of European history out of it. And the Pope and everybody kicked up a massive fuss about it. But you could see why, because you can't draw attention to what, in fact, when you look at it, is completely obvious. But I think we're past that now. And I think, therefore, that the, the best way is for European leaders to be honest about this and to, to try and say, well, what do we do about it? You know, how do we frame this? How can we acknowledge um, the fact that, that, that the idea of the secular, the idea, you know, these ideas that we frame as being universal values are not universal at all. They're not universal. They're bred of, as all ideas are, of cultural contingency, of specific traditions, of specific ways of seeing the world. And it so happens that, that these ways are essentially Christian. And we need to, I think, you know, if, 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 if our multicultural societies are to function, I think we now have to, to accept that and think, try and work out what we're going to do about it. Because the alternative is that you end up in a situation like France, where laïcité is, is it, the fact that laïcité is, is, is neutral is such a kind of fundamental part of French ideology that, that, that people are very, very reluctant to contemplate that that might not be the case. And so as a result, you, you get the French state getting more and more furious with its Muslim citizens for not accepting a principle that, of course, is a fundamentally Christian one. I think we've gone, you know, we've gone beyond that stage. People need to accept that the idea of the secular, the idea of laïcité, however you want to frame it, and it, it exists in different contexts and different understandings in different countries. Nevertheless, that is a constant across Europe. These ideas are not culturally neutral. These ideas are bred of the deep subsoil of Christian history and Christian theology. And I think it is more honest to acknowledge that than to pretend it's not the case. Thank you very much. I'm so happy with that last question because um, um, this, <laughs> yes, this, happens, this happens to be um, uh, the kickoff evening of our third forum on European culture. And you've been cooperating with um, uh, uh, the previous two editions of it. Um, we asked you to, the first one was called Rethinking Europe. The second one was um, uh, called Act for Democracy. We've been making um, uh, uh, anthologies of European thought and European speeches and European political speeches. We asked you to write a chapter in the first one we did four years ago, Homogeneity and Diversity, Tom Holland, uh, one of the chapters in it is, and a lot of the, the, the things we've been discussing tonight and the book we've been discussing tonight, you uh, have sort of sketched earlier in, in this essay as well. Um, it's, a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful essay as well. Um, and this night is also the night for the kickoff of our third edition of it, which will happen in June. And we've asked anna Marijn and Simon to very shortly um, show a little bit of the program in a few minutes we are going to have in June, because this is sort of the kickoff on the Forum, of, forum on European Culture, because what we will be discussing there is uh, the theme this year would be We the People, um, Wir sind das Volk, and um, um, what is a European Demos? Is there a European Demos? Is it influenced by Christianity? Is it not? Is it secular? Is, it, uh, is there a, a European space in which to uh, discuss those things? And you're both here. Two of the editors of the Forum on European Culture will, will briefly, very briefly, kick it off for you tonight. And it will be in June, so you have to hold your breath till June. <laughs> Simon, Anna Marijn. <laughs> Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Anna Marijn Apkar and I am one of the program makers of the Forum on European Culture. I would like to invite you to join our forum um, from the 4th till the 7th of June. Um, uh, so within a few months, it's called uh, We the People and we're trying to dig into this concept of a European demos. Um, what does it mean? Uh, does it even exist? Also building up on many of the questions that were raised uh, tonight. So I would warmly like to invite you to uh, look at our website, cultureforum.eu, to watch all the programs. And uh, Simon, to shed a light on some of the highlights um, that are coming up in a few months. 
Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we can look through uh, a little bit of the programming that we're uh, pub that we've published today and that are now open also for ticket sales. Um, opening performance that will happen on Thursday, the fourth of June, is a uh, opening performance by the th uh, Brian Dorries, um, perhaps known from the Theatre of War productions that he made in uh, the United States. He transforms tragedies uh, of the Greek um, tradition to contemporary uh, topics to, to contemporary. Uh, themes and uh, the opening uh, performance uh, of the forum will take place in the uh, open air theater of the Vondel Park, um, uh, transforming the story, the, the suppliants by Aeschylus, um, to a, a, a contemporary story on migration in uh, Europe. Um, so this, this will be a kickoff of, uh, of the forum officially. Um, then we have a host of other uh, uh, programs. It's a little too much to run through it all together right now, but we just have uh, come up with a small selection. Naming the, th the, the theme of the forum, We the People, also um, brings the responsibility almost to widen the, 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 the scope of what you do at the forum. So we widen it to include also categories of popular culture, which we will analyze and, and, and delve into during the forum, uh, including Cooking and uh, food culture in Europe, um, a program that we will we'll develop together with uh, Joris Beiderdijk, chef of the Rijks, the restaurant of the Rijks Museum, uh, and Claudia Roden, a famed cultural, cultural anthropologist and culinary uh, author. Uh, that will be a very exciting program, also taking place on Thursday, the 4th of June, the opening day. Um, Johnny Pitts, we will travel together with Johnny Pitts, uh, uh, who, ha who, who has his project, Afropeans. Um, Exploring the commonalities, the shared experiences of Afri African European uh, uh, African Europeans across the continent in many different cities. Um, a, a, a group that is often overlooked, a group that shares many of the similar challenges, but often these challenges are framed within their own national context and not so much within uh, the European whole. So uh, he will be uh, central to this program and we uh, are going on this travel together with him. Uh, football, another element of popular culture, of course, is a great cultural prism to look at Europe. It is our own favorite uh, game on the continent, uh, but it is also the way in which we uh, develop national stereotypes. It is the way in which we develop identities and stick to certain kind of tribes uh, before we ultimately uh, d explore the ways in which football also can be yeah, reused. Can, we can discover its potential to bring people closely together, uh, ultimately. And then we are very uh, uh, proud and to, include, to be able to include the European literature Richer night of uh, the European National Institutes for Culture as part of the programming of the forum this year, uh, with no less than 12 uh, nations represented here in the European Literature Night. Uh, this will be uh, yeah, a selection of, of authors that uh, really delve into this uh, theme of We the People, that really um, focus on those communities left behind in, um, in, the, in, the, in the fast pace of European integration in the last. Uh, 20 years, let's say. So um, this is a very exciting element. Then also we have um, uh, um, something that cannot be ignored. The last two years is the rise of popular move protest movements across Europe. Not only that, that, but also the fact that they seem to be increasingly able to transpose their message to a transnational, uh, in a transnational way. Think of Extinction Rebellion, with Extinction Rebellion, which is uh, appearing and swarming city centres all over uh, Europe, uh, but also think about um, a very transnational um, cause or something we saw uh, in, in the rise of the Sardine movement uh, uh, from Italy, but also um, appearing in the capitals of Berlin, London, Paris, Amsterdam. We see a rise of transnational activism. We see maybe a forming of a, first, of a European true civil society. And so we invite the protagonists of these movements to uh, the stage to uh, interview them and to uh, share their, their strategies, share their missions. Um, for the future and for the future of the continent as well. Um, so yes, this is uh, uh, what you see when you uh, go to our website. You can scroll and see the first few programs that are uh, now um, in pub uh, public. Um, of course, many more to follow and uh, we hope to all greet you there and uh, thank you so much for giving us the, uh, the opportunity to uh, share the program with you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom Holland. Thank you, thank you very, very much.